Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Communion today. Holy Communion. You know, Jesus said we should partake of this every time we gathered. And the only time you gathered at that time was on Passover, uh, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. About three times a year. And uh, because they did not have transportation at that time like we do today. So... It is good, though, when you do take it when you need it. If you're puny, not feeling good or so forth, it's a good thing. Take Holy Communion. And uh, our Father put this in a way that it documents, number one, that you're a believer, and number two, that you obey His Word, and number three, that you enjoy doing it, basically, and, it, and, and that you have faith. Uh, naturally, when you do it, it gives credentials that you are a Christ man, a Christian, or you wouldn't be doing it, okay? We're, go we're going to begin this today with uh, Hebrews chapter 10. I want to understand what the sacrifice was, how Christ became the sacrifice of sacrifices. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, with a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, uh, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices uh, which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereof perfect. There's no way that those dead animals could do that. Okay, And um, what is that good that would come? If you turn back to the ninth chapter in the 11th verse, you find out, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, temple, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. Why? It's a many-membered body. Christ's many-membered body. That's the good thing to come. You know what? You're a part of it. You're in that building when you believe, when you love Him, and when you make up the many-membered body of Christ, the temple. Uh, that's the good thing that would come. This is why he could say on the day that that uh, his trial was taking place, destroy this temple and I can rebuild it in three days, because he did. He resurrected and brought in the kingdom of God, because he was the king of kings and lord of lords. And those that remained by saw it, saw it come to pass. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? If they didn't, why, why did they... Uh, keep doing it, or why are they still not doing it? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. In other words, if it really accomplished what it should have, the sacrificing of animals, taking the best thing you got out of the herd and offering it to God, then uh, it should have, uh, it would no more, you would no more have a conscience of sins. But guilt keeps coming back, okay? Verse 3, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Well, man does sin every year. You know, this is why we have to repent. But this is why that the This is why you want to be so thankful to our heavenly Father for the sacrifice of sacrifices, the sacrifice that ended blood rituals forever. His shed blood on the cross that makes repentance possible and in that great book of life that you're judged by as to where you're going when you repent the negative by your name is erased the good the righteous acts stay there that's what you're rewarded for but each time you repent because he paid that price so that he could say forgiven it was paid in full, paid in full on the cross. Once you repent, though, don't ever let anyone tell you that Christ paid the price and you don't even have to repent, or you're going to end up with a dirty page in the book of life, big time. Okay. Uh, verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. There's just no way, no way that it would. Uh, verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh, when he cometh who? When Christ cometh, 
into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And um, my, my ears you have opened, as, as, as it would read in Psalms chapter 40. Okay? And, um, and, and so it is. Uh, it, Paul, uh, we, what we do here, Paul inserts part of Psalms 40 and puts the words of David in Christ's mouth here. But then, who is the author of all the word? David, at that time, spoke the words because they came from Christ. Okay? Even in Psalms chapter 40. And uh, so, so it is. So it is the word of God. All right? Verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure... Do you think it gave God pleasure to, to have those burnt animals offered to him? He loves animals. Uh, of course he didn't. And he, you know why? Because it states in Hebrew, uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, I didn't want your burnt offerings. I don't want them. I want your love, your mercy. That's what I want out of you. And that's what he wants out of you to this day. As a matter of fact, he wants your love in return for the great love he showed to you by preparing that body, that body that was to come, that is to say the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have seen the Son, what was his name to be called? Emmanuel. What does it translate? God with us. So when God said, let us create man in our image, he included himself. He's not going to ask you to do something that he can't do a lot better. Okay, So, therefore, when you see the Son, you've seen the Father, that body that would come, that would be the sacrifice for one and all time. Why? Your Father loves you. Get that, let that settle deep in your mind. Even though you're a sinner, when you repent, He loves you, and He loves you to the point that 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 was to come, that good thing... Christ's body, that it's forgiven when you repent. That is to say, Father, I'm sorry. Let me ask you something. Uh, so that I, I like to put uh, feelings because God has feelings. Have you ever had someone you really cared a lot for or a child come to you and say, I really messed up, but I am sorry. Will you please forgive me? And you take them in your arms and you hold them and you say, Darling, you forgive. Don't, don't even worry about it. Don't give it a second thought. Well, that's the way our Father feels. Okay? That's why He loves you. He doesn't love burnt offerings. The only reason the burnt offerings were there, it cost you something to put it there where you realized the value. In other words, it had to be the best out of your herd, and that was money. Okay? Verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now, where, where was that written in the book? Again, in Psalms chapter 40. And um, I'm going to read verse 6 and 7 so that you see where it is written. Psalms chapter 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. In other words, I hear the truth. I understand the truth. I, I understand the spirituality that our Father has in this, in his love. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required, didn't enjoy them. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. He was the living word. He was the volume of the book. The book that we should absorb. Because when you absorb that book, that volume, in your mind, then you have the seal of God in your forehead, in your knowledge. God's people are destroyed because of what? Lack of knowledge. Where does your knowledge come from? From the book, the volume of the book. Or, if you prefer the original, scroll. The Word. God's Word. Um, and um, verse 8, back in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8 reads, 
above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law i mean it was added it was it was necessary by the law in other words to receive forgiveness you had to pay something and you paid with a very not something with a blemish not something with a broken leg i mean the best you had you gave to the Father. Verse 9. And even that, that wasn't what he required. It was only to sit, let you, hopefully, with the law being the schoolmaster, I'm going to repeat that, with the law being the schoolmaster, when it cost you dearly, you figured it was worth something. And when you hear someone say salvation is free, don't, don't, don't be um, taken by that in any great hurry, for it cost an awesome price. It cost him his life on that cross, losing his blood life, uh, life of blood, his very, the very flesh. He did it for you. He had no sin. He had not sinned. He was executed though he was innocent for us, for you, and for all those that want, it, want that opportunity to have him as the perpetuation for all sin on repentance. And again, no, it cost him an awesome price, so love him as he loved you. Verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He took away the first commandment concerning burnt offerings, so that he could establish something far better. Verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not every year. Not to do it over and over. One time crucified is sufficient for one and all times. That when he was nailed to the cross, all blood orders, statutes, ordinances were nailed to that cross with him. And his blood paid that price. And his blood is the very thing that washes your sins away on repentance. And you know something? He that died on the cross was perfect. He didn't sin. But he knew we would. And he knew that uh, in doing this, and naturally the main reason he did it, you would find back in the second chapter of this book of Hebrews, I, I think I'll just take a moment, you're not going to have it on the screen, but I'm going to turn back to chapter 2 of this great book of Hebrews, verse 14, listen to it. For much then as the children are partakers of the flesh that came here born and blood, he also himself, took part of the same. He was birthed. He was given birth by Mary. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. In other words, the devil is he that prodded them on to say, Crucify him! And now when it comes that day to open the great lake of fire, say, he can rightfully now say, Satan, walk. Get into the fire. You're done. You're finished. Because, you know, Satan was his child also. And now he has ample reason. In all fairness, time to walk the plank into the lake of fire. And at the same time, protecting his children that he loves. For one in all times, he became that sacrifice of sacrifices. And it's not free, my friend. It cost all of us a great deal. It cost us Messiah. But then it was part of God's plan, as stated in verse 1 of this, the good things that would come, that it, he paved the way for us, that no one dies 
but to be absent from this body is present with him. If you believe he resurrected, then you better believe they have also that are with him. For one in all times. That's why you want to be real careful when you say, well, I got to get saved again. Uh-uh, that's a no-no. No, no. You must repent again. You see, Christ does the saving. And for you to say you have to be saved again is an insult to the Lord Jesus Christ. Insult. It's calling him a failure. It's like re-crucifying him all over as Hebrews chapter 6 would so declare. It takes repentance to say you're sorry. He did it for one and all times. Don't try to cause him to be crucified again. It won't happen. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It was a schoolmaster teaching us how that it would come to pass. Verse 12. But this man, that's to say Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice... For sins forever set down on the right hand of God. There he is today. He is there as your um, lawyer, your advocate, your comforter. He has the um, ear of the Creator at any time, being the Creator. Verse 13. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now, if he sits at the right hand of God and remains there, who, tell me, is going to make his enemies his footstool? He's not leaving. You are. His elect by allowing the Holy Spirit to utilize them, to speak through them. As it is written in the book, the enemy, this is why he gave us power over Satan and all our enemies, so that we can put them where they belong, by standing for something. A man or a woman or a child that won't stand for something will stand for nothing. That is the duty of Christ's people, Christ man's Christians, is to do the will of Almighty God. It is written. Have, have you read it? Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Sanctified meaning set aside, have repented, understand, willing to serve in Christ's army, ready to go, in the sight of God, to obey Almighty God. Not just to be a hearer, but to be a doer of God's Word. Verse 15, Whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, in other words, that's our contact, 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, minds, and in their minds, and I will write them. And so it is. Where did he do that? Isaiah 54, along about verse 13. How beautiful it is. Have you read it? It's there. Um... This is why that on the first day of the millennium, you won't have to ask your neighbor, do you understand the word of God? Verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Once they, are, have, been, once they have repented for their problems, their sins, God says, I don't want to hear about it again. This is where so many people really mess up. They earnestly fall on their knees, or you don't have to fall on your knees, just ask for forgiveness for something. And then when you know he did, you turn around the next day and ask the same thing all over. You throw it right back in his face. You're calling him a fake. He told you, I will hear, I will forgive. 
and stop throwing it back in my face by praying about it again. You either believe or you're a fake yourself. So be careful, my friend. Be very careful. He says here, I remember no more. I don't want to hear about it again. But fine, when he forgives, it's erased. It's as though it never happened. So why are you bringing it back up again? Uh, word to the wise is sufficient. Verse 18. Now, where remission, or this sin's forgotten, uh, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Why? They don't exist. Didn't happen. When God says, I forgive you and I blot it out, it is gone. It's erased from the book of life. You don't have to answer for it. That's the beauty of the love of Almighty God. That He is all in one, complete. I suppose maybe one of the reasons that man is so doubtful and brings some up is because of man. Because man doesn't like to, you know, sometimes you'll have some person who will say, I, I forgive you for that, and then they bring it up again the next day. They didn't forgive you. They sure don't forget. Okay, and We're not supposed to forget necessarily. It reminds us that things uh, take time and healing. Verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. In other words, when you're forgiven, when you repent, you can, this is why he rent the veil on the day that he was crucified. He rent it from, of the, of the holy of holies, from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top, from top to bottom. That was not a flimsy piece of material. It's thick. And it was ripped from top to bottom and parted. And it was to say, come on in. Boldly come in. In other words, you do not need someone to be between you and your Father in the Holy of Holies. You can just go right on in and uh, visit with Him uh, because you're family. Okay? Verse 20. By a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that's to say the body, that is to say His flesh, His body, arranged that for us Christ's body on that cross his resurrected body that arranged it for us that we have that opportunity I don't know have you read it have you taken advantage of it my next question would be do you believe it do you believe God if you don't you're wasting your time if you do believe him it doesn't exist it didn't happen. This is why even when one is pitched into the lake of fire at the end, they're blotted out. That's why there will be no tears in heaven. You won't even remember them. It's as though they never existed, only the good. That's the good thing about heaven. That's the good thing about our Father. All that offend shall be destroyed. There will be no tears. Verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of God, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, that's what our, he is, the Melchizedek, king of peace, king of the just. 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. You better believe, faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our um, and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, um, you don't have to be ashamed to go on in. He cleanses you. What cleanses you? His blood washes all your sins white as snow. His body brings healing to your body. But His blood is the forgiveness of sins. Totally annihilates them. They don't exist. This is why it isn't safe for you to bring something back up again. Because if you were a real believer, you would know it doesn't exist today. That is not to say that you, in your mind, you don't remember it. Because 
that is experience that prevents you, if you use good judgment, for ever letting it happen again. Okay? Verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Don't you be wavering around, changing mind, Johnny this, Johnny that. When God doesn't, He's always true. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never change uh, uh, paddles with you in the middle of the stream. He will always be with you. He will strengthen you. So what are you going to waver about? You know, God isn't that fond of wimps. Okay, uh, you know because what? If you're a wimp and you begin to waver, it kind of shows you lack a little bit of faith. And you know something? You might say, people will say, well, are you a believer? Well, I believe a little bit. No, you don't. You either believe or you don't. It's cut and dried. You're either a believer or you're not a believer. If you believe just a little bit, all you're doing is working on it. Do you think God's going to take you serious as long as you just believe a little bit? He'll wait. Thank you all the same. He'll wait until you mature, until he can count on you. He only wants troopers that he can count on, that are disciplined, that can stand for something, that can have faith in his word to know he does not lie, that he is with you. So don't be doing any of this wavering business. Stay true to his word. I mean, after all, he did die on the cross for you. He didn't waver. He didn't whimper. He did it gladly. Why? Because he loves you. So don't be playing games with him. Okay? He's faithful to his promise. You be faithful to yours. Let's have the next verse, please. Verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke, or that is to say to help, unto love and to good works. Let's lead someone that is down. Pick them up. Help them. Help them to find the correct path. Help them on the way. That's what brotherhood is about. And we all are all brothers in Christ. To strengthen one another. To remind one another of the word. For it is our rule. It is our way of life. And it is the word that brings us blessings from Almighty God when we serve Him adequately and with love. One more, one more verse, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, uh, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The, the day of His coming, the day of His return. The day that we're supposed to put his enemies at his footstool. Okay. He gave you the power. He gave you the authority. He gave you the plan on how to put them there. And he expects you to follow it through. And some are going to say, well, well now wait a minute, brother. I don't, I'm not that much of a scholar. Well, you don't, it's not you that does the talking anyway if you understand God's word. Mark chapter 13 makes it very clear. That when you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, you're not to premeditate what you say. God will do the talking, okay? All you have to do is obey. Is to boldly go in. And when you are going before the synagogue of Satan, you do it with the boldness of a man, woman, or a child of God. Because you have the authority to smoke the whole bunch. He's with you. The Spirit is with you. So you do it boldly and don't you waver. You discipline yourself and realize the power, the dunamis in the Greek, dynamite, that God gives those that are willing to make that stand that are sanctified, that are set apart, that have his marching orders. I don't know, have you read them? They're not really that complicated. A child can understand them. All right, now we're going to be taking the communion in the next half hour. 
We're going to take a break here. If you haven't got the ingredients, go get them while we're on this break. And when we come back, we'll complete with communion. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, if we may, and then we'll, or, or we'll show it occasionally. We're going to continue right on into the communion service. And I hope by now that you have the ingredients. And uh, never let anyone tell you or judge you on taking communion. If you believe Christ was worthy to pay that price we just read about concerning that he was the sacrifice for one in all times, I don't see how there could be any doubt in any Christian's mind. Then you can take communion because it's not whether you're worthy or not, it's whether he was. And I, I think that every Christian knows. Uh, many of us are not perfect. I don't know if you ever figured that out or not. And if we were to wait till we were perfect, we'd probably never take communion. But it's whether you believe he was worthy, and certainly he was. We're, gonna, we're going to go into some of that worthiness, if we may, in the great book of Isaiah. We're going to cover just a little bit of the 53rd chapter, maybe all of it if we have time. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, and it reads, who hath believed our report? Question. A lot of people don't. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who has eyes to see? Who has ears to hear? I think you know. Verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. He's just a boy. A babe. And as a root out of a dry ground. A root out of Jesse. He hath no form nor comeliness. He lacked nothing. And when we saw, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire of him. He's got it all. He's made the full pattern, the comfort of the eyes, the appearance, the, the, the very presence is overshadowing, overpowering the Messiah. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. That's the way men are. A man of sorrows. You know, he, he was given a lot of sorrow. And acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. It seemed nobody cared. Speaking of multitudes. You know it is an amazing thing, and I'm sure it about broke his heart, that thousands followed him out in the desert. And he took two little fishes and five loaves of barley bread and broke them and gave thanks to God and fed 5,000. 5,000. And when it was over, they followed him not because they loved him. Not because they believed him, but because they wanted another fish sandwich. Boy, how, how, I mean, how it must have broke his heart to be, to know he was Messiah walking before them. And to show a miracle like that, how could, who could work a miracle like that? Only Messiah. And they doubt. If I could only be sure. 
And one day too late, Charlie, sometimes you want to be real careful. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected, verse 4 rather. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken. We saw him driven through, smitten of God and afflicted. Got it to happen. He was nailed to that cross exactly as it was written he would be in, in Psalms 22. The one that came here to do all these things for us. Perform miracles, heal people. This is what they did to him. Verse 5. But he was wounded, he was pierced. For our transgressions, not his, our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. This is how you accept a healing. Just to know, his body took the punishment. And when you anoint with the oil of our people, and when you ask for that healing, it's his body that took the punishment that put him at the right hand of God in the very mercy seat that he can show mercy to the world, to everyone that believeth. And according to his will and according to his plan to touch and bring that healing forward for he is the healer of all healers, Melchizedek, king of the just, and yet so humbly served on the cross that you and I, though we be sinners still, can boldly march into the Holy of Holies to serve God. Yes, his body took the punishment and we get the healing for. How precious it is that he could have escaped this. He could have called down 10,000 angels at any moment. He did not do that because he was doing it for you that you could have forgiveness on repentance. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He carried it. And again, though, he didn't whimper and he didn't hold back. Uh, and it is true that with the exception of a few women that stood on a hill, not overlooking, everyone else fled. And I have to speak on John's behalf. Christ did send him away with Mary. <clears throat> They fled like a bunch of sheep, but the shepherd gone. They scattered. You're not going to do that. When it comes time to be delivered before the most false Messiah, as it is written in Mark 13, you're going. You're going to do it gladly because you do not find the false Messiah tempting. You find him rather on the contrary to be a filth the abomination and you do it for your people that the spirit speaking through you can convince even the gainsayers as it's written in Luke 21 by what you say at that time the Holy Spirit speaking he didn't back down he didn't say let's put this off let me think about it verse 7 he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He, he was innocent. He could have at least said, I'm innocent, but he did not. He did not open his mouth as it was written. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shares is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He did not defend himself one iota. Do you know why? 
Do you know why? He was doing it for you. Because you do have, you have had sin. And he was doing it for you. That's why he didn't open his mouth. Because all the sin on repentance were paid for at that time. That is not the unforgivable one. Not one complaint did he make. And yet he was innocent. That's how much he loved you. And still loves you. For he is the same yesterday, he is today, and he will be forever. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. He didn't really receive any judgment. That means that that is just. He was innocent. Even Pontius Pilate himself said, I wash my hands of this innocent man's blood. And who shall declare his generation? Are, are you? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Not for his own. And he sits at the right hand of God now. And uh, who is going to declare his generation? Christians that have the power and the authority with the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God and the Son speaking through them, will put the enemies of God at the, his, as his footstool. Verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked. He had two malefactors on each side of him as he was crucified. Praise God, one of them repented. And he looked at him and he said, This day I will see you in paradise. You overcame. And with the rich in his death, his, his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich man, had a fresh hewn tomb. And he was placed in a very rich man's grave. Naturally, it was family, kinsman, redeemer. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. God saw to it that he had this, this, uh, de this decent, dignified burial. He didn't stay there long. Okay. But what you want to understand, these little prophecies came to pass exactly as they are written. No ifs, no ands, no maybes. This was written 700 years before the fact. And every detail, every little detail came to pass line on line just as God's plan went forth. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, that's his offspring, his children. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and it shall it does, and you're proof of it. You're his seed, offspring, reward that has faith, that believes, that follows, that knows truth when they hear it, for he hath opened your ears. Don't ever forget, when we cover this particular chapter of how he was bruised, don't ever forget that 14th verse in Hebrews chapter 2. He didn't ask you to do something he, that he wouldn't do himself. He was born in the flesh also. Only his flesh was crucified. So he could do what? So he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. And in part, that's where you come into this. For you will witness against that false one, that devil that brings his final death in the lake of fire. You're a part, your family. You want to always be glad of that and return that love. Verse 11. He shall see the travail of his we he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. It please him. By his knowledge, listen to me closely, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. 
He's not going to disappoint us. He, he didn't disappoint the Father. And his knowledge, which is to say the word, lo, I come in the volume of the book, is the knowledge that causes his children uh, not to lose. For it is lack of, lack of knowledge that destroys children. But it, his knowledge brings forth eternal life. Not that we're perfect and deserve it, but that he paid the price and on repentance he erases our problems and gives us that eternal life. His knowledge, his wisdom. Do you understand that um, that um, when when he forgives, he it's to to justify as the word servant justify many, means it makes it right. Where you were all wrong, but when you repented, he makes it right because of forgiveness. Verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. I don't know, are you? Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, <clears throat> and he has, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Died right between two malefactors, two murderers and thieves. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. He interceded for you. Did you know that he loves you that much? Do you know that he cares that much? And that he did justify you. Now at this time, if you have not the ingredients, you go get them at this time. And, um, and we're, we will be partaking of the cup and of the bread. What is it that we do when he took the bread and he blessed it? He said, this is my body that is broken for you. It was broken, but you received the healing, healing in your life. When, when, when you have problems, he is that healer that can put it together for you. He is the one that gives you strength, that causes you to overcome. And even though his body was so beautiful, because when he said, let us make man in our image, it was made in his image. And that's why in John chapter 14, Jesus could say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because he was in the perfect image of Almighty God. You know, our Father truly treasures his children. He calls them a treasure. That he paid this price. That we have this forgiveness and eternal life. That he gives us though it cost him an awesome price. So, when we, when he says he is the intercessor, he is that. So, as we take these ingredients, many times healings take place right there, right then. Though it was his body that took those stripes and yours that receives the healing. So, at this time, let us prepare. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take ye and eat you all of it. Oh, Heavenly Father, Thank you, Father, for the price you paid that brings us the freedom of the healing, the well-being of the stripes you took in paying that price, that these things are made available to your servants. May it help us to become better servants. May it lead us and direct us into a richer, more meaningful life to know that we are Christ bags. That is to say, Christian, we thank you, Father, 
for that privilege and the fact that you have done this for us. Amen. And so it is that his body did take those tribes. It amazes me and I always like to think, and it's a very strengthening thing. They pleaded with him. Pontius Pilate pleaded with him. Say something, man. I know you're innocent. My wife was visited last night by an angel and she said you were perfect. Speak up. They mean they want your life. Christ held back. He didn't open his mouth. Why? It's prophecy. Prophecy in the Word of God that he would not open his mouth. Why? It wasn't his sins he was dying for. It's ours. So don't ever forget to be thankful for that. Innocent as he was, he stood there for you in accessory. It doesn't hurt sometimes for you to make an intercessory prayer for others. Don't just think about self. Many times it's good for you to think about others and make an intercessory prayer for them. Because many, even though they may not know, if he interceded for you, you certainly can be big enough to intercede for others. After all, when you're delivered up before the false messiah, are you doing it for self? Of course not. You're doing it for others. God's elect were sent to this earth. I chose you before the foundations of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Now, he knows he can count on you. He knows you'll stand for something. So see that you do. But draw your strength from the things he has left for us. His body and his blood. His blood is what washes away all your sins. Sins that you have committed and that you repent for on taking Holy Communion. His blood being the wine that was the first miracle Christ to perform at Canaan at, and the place of the reeds at a wedding because it stands for purity through fermentation purifying itself in that cup which is his blood that forgives that washes away, that makes you perfect. Again, never let some man judge you in communion. If you know Christ was worthy and how could you doubt, then you can take Holy Communion. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood that is shed for many. Take ye and drink ye all of it. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the washing away of sins, Father. The forgiveness that you so, so generously bring to us. That you have paid that price, that you interceded for us, Father. Thank you, Father, and may we receive that healing and that forgiveness that is promised. We know that you always keep your word, that you will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. Thank you for that, Father. We appreciate it so very much. And so it is, and so it was, that he left us these things that are so ever precious, that gives us the strength, the courage, and makes it so easy to carry his work forward, his will. What is his will? Saving people, saving his children. They're lost. They need help. But by the grace of God, there go I. They need to be taught. They need to be led. And most of all, the enemy needs to be put under the footstool. How is that done? By truth. And with being fortified with his very presence within us, he and us, 
And we in Him accomplished that. Find no problem accomplishing it because you're children of God. How our Father loves His children. And, and you know something? The ends He has gone to to make it possible for a child to understand his love and to return that because that's what he wants as it's written in the last verse of Hebrews chapter 4 he created all things for his pleasure you give him pleasure when you let him know you love him it lets him know you appreciate the fact that he did not ask you to be born in the flesh that he refused to be born himself he came just like you in a, in a body that can appreciate pain. He did that for us. How can we not love Him? How can we not return that love? You know, I love you very much because you do love His Word and you stay in His Word. I love you because you study His Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, He loves you for it. It makes His day. It truly does. It really makes His day. We are brought to you with your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Bless God. You know what? He will always bless you. What's most important? Lo, I come in the volume of the book. Stay in the Word. Every day in the Word. Set aside a little time. Every day is a good day, even with trouble, because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding.